To date, the novel coronavirus has infected more than 31,000 people. It has spread to 25 countries and led to more than 600 deaths. 12 cases have been reported in the United States, including four here in the Bay Area. So in a few minutes, we'll be hearing from our speakers who will discuss what we know and don't know about the novel coronavirus, why these outbreaks are so difficult to predict and prevent, how the media have been covering this issue, and how we in the public health community can best respond. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Art Rheingold is the Division Head of Epidemiology and Boss Statistics at Berkeley Public Health. Professor Rheingold has worked on the prevention and control of infectious diseases in the United States for over 40 years, including at the US CDC and with numerous developing countries around the world. He has directed the CDC-funded California Emerging Infection uh, Programs since 1994. Aaron Alday is an award-winning reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle who has been covering health issues since 2006. Of note, Erin started her journalism career at the Daily Californian, and many years later, she still calls Berkeley her home. They will be joined by special guest, Dr. Anna Hart, who is the medical director at the University Health Services Tank Center and has been coordinating the campus coronavirus response. Dr. Hart has a special clinical interest in infectious diseases, travel medicine, transgender health, and the care of underserved populations. She also consults for the City of Berkeley Public Health Division's tuberculosis program. <coughs> Art will start us off with a brief talk about the novel coronavirus. Next, we'll go into a conversation with Aaron, Art, and Anna and then fill questions from the audience. So, Art, will you lead us off? <coughs> thank you, Dean Lu. So, thank you all for coming. Um, I, I understand at least some students and colleagues came mostly today to see if I'd wear a suit, <laughs> uh, or at least a tie. So I'm sorry to disappoint. If that's the main reason you came, you can leave now and make room for other people. Um, may, maybe next time. Um, so obviously th this is not a, a topic for levity, and I apologize if that uh, humorous remark uh, bother anyone, but this is a very serious problem. Uh, and as we've agreed, I'm going to give a brief uh, a synopsis of what we know, at least as of this morning, uh, as I uh, can put it together. Uh, and, and then we'll have both uh, some information from uh, the, the person, Anna Hart, who's in charge of the campus response. And, making sure our students and faculty and staff are safe, um, working with the city of Berkeley, uh, and a conversation um, uh, with Erin about um, uh, a variety of things. And, but we're planning to leave a large amount of time for your questions and for discussion. So don't get frustrated. Uh, that, that's a, a major part of what we'll be doing. Um, uh, and, and I also just want to point out that um, this is a very, this is a new virus. It's a rapidly evolving uh, set of circumstances. And so anyone who claims to be an expert is an instant expert uh, who's basically working with information everyone in the room has access to. So you can go online and look at the CDC website or the WHO website or the New York Times uh, and, or, or scientific papers which are published electronically because that's what I did, right? I haven't been to China although I'm supposed to go to Malaysia in 10 days. Um, uh, but, I, you know, so we all rely on those sources, and they're all open sources that anyone can access. So, uh, and I know I have some extremely smart colleagues in the room who, if I say something wrong, will undoubtedly correct me, uh, both from a statistical point of view or from a clinical medicine point of view. So if I can figure out how to advance the slide. So first of all, that is a picture of a coronavirus. Uh, it's typically seen in cross-section when these little projections look like crowns. So it looks like a circle with crowns all around it. Corona is, of course, the Latin word for crown. So that's a picture of this novel virus. Um, and I'm sure Eva Harris will tell me if I get this wrong, but my understanding oops, uh, is that um, this 2019 novel coronavirus is a single-stranded RNA virus uh, in, in, in this family of coronavidae. 
Uh, there are uh, multiple uh, uh, genomes have been described. Uh, the genetic sequence is about 80% similar to the SARS coronavirus, so fairly closely related to the SARS coronavirus, and it's 96% similar to a coronavirus found in this creature, the horseshoe bat. Uh, so I think all of the early reporting that could this have come from a fish, could this have come from a bird, uh, I think those of us who know about this virus were quite convinced from the outset that this came from a mammal, uh, probably initially from a bat, whether then to another species, or directly from a bat to a person, uh, I think all the evidence is that this originated in a bat. Um, so the first known human infection uh, was in early December uh, in Wuhan. Uh, molecular clock studies suggest that also that that was the approximate date of origin in, in humans. Um, and phylogenetic studies uh, suggest the transmission, in fact, did occur from a single infected animal. And I can't explain any of that, so I'll ask Eva Harris to explain it if you have questions about it. Um, so I, many of you know that uh, before SARS, we knew about coronaviruses, and they were considered to be basically the cause of minor upper respiratory infections that were self-limited. And no one paid much attention to them because they didn't cause that much morbidity or any mortality. It wasn't until 2002, with the outbreak of SARS, uh, that began in South China, uh, and, and then uh, went to Hong Kong and a variety of other countries that people got interested in, in these viruses. And then particularly when a coronavirus caused the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome uh, as well, that uh, interest picked up even further. Um, so just to remind you what happened with SARS, I happened to be in Hong Kong during the SARS epidemic, so it's still fresh in my mind. Um, but, but you can see that at least according to the WHO summary, uh, the SARS epidemic produced uh, 8,422 cases, many of them in healthcare workers who were exposed occupationally uh, before isolation procedures were, were, were put in place to protect them. Uh, there were 916 deaths for a case fatality of, of 11%. Uh, cases were detected in 32 countries, and we had 33 here in the United States. But as you know, that outbreak was, was basically brought to a conclusion. Uh, you can see uh, within about uh, eight months, uh, there have not been any further SARS cases in the world that I know of since that time. Um, and, and so you could call this a public health success story in terms of uh, bringing this particular outbreak to an end. Um, so, of course, I made this slide this morning. It's already out of date, so that illustrates one of the issues, which is that these numbers are constantly updated. So the dean mentioned 31,000 cases, um, and by now it's probably 33,000 cases. Um, so you can, check, you can go on your cell phone and see what someone is saying now. But clearly, this is an enormous uh, problem. Um, and um, you can see approximately 600 deaths so far. But I think everyone knows, if you read the newspapers, that we know that these are extraordinarily likely to be underestimates of the number of cases, even bigger underestimates of the number of people infected, and quite likely an underestimate of the number of people who have died. So uh, really, we don't know a lot, um, but you can take these numbers for what they are. And of course, uh, this map um, shows that the fact that the vast majority of the cases are in China, particularly in Wuhan, uh, but there has been spread uh, to other countries in the world. And so this was the map as of uh, 9.30 p.m. Eastern time on February 5th. Undoubtedly, the map is different now, uh, but, but that was the map as of last night. Um, and here you can see the distribution of cases, uh, again, by country. Uh, and I'll get to the United States in a minute, but clearly we have had transmission uh, primarily basically by travelers either returning from China to these countries or traveling from China to these countries. Um, and to a very limited extent, in a few instances, transmission within those countries to a close contact. Okay. Um, so in the United States, at least as of last night, there were 12 confirmed cases in the United States, six here in California, uh, two of them in Santa Clara County, two in San Benito County, one each in Los Angeles and Orange County, and then two cases in Illinois and one case each in Arizona, Massachusetts, Washington, and Wisconsin. Now, this does not include individuals who might currently be quarantined in Army or military bases in, in California and elsewhere, but as far as I know, there are no confirmed cases in any of those quarantined uh, in individuals as of this date. Um, so um, I just want to, uh, this is a, a, a public service announcement. 
Um, so this is from the newspaper about the response to the case in the state of Washington. And I just want to point out what it says here, that the emergency is global, but it's public health officials who isolate the sick, trace close contacts, and deliver thermometers. And it was a, a friend of mine, Jonathan Mann, who some of you may recognize his name from the AIDS epidemic. Uh, well, before that, he was a state health officer in New Mexico. And he convinced my wife and me that if you really want to do public health, you should be at the local level, because it's local public health that really uh, has to respond to problems like this. Um, and, and so, um, and I would just like to point out that it's schools of public health like ours that train the people who go out and do this work at the local level. So I take enormous pride in knowing that people who graduate our school and other schools are really at the front lines doing this work. Um, so this is just to say that uh, th these are people under investigation. You can see, even though this was the same date, um, uh, February 5th, it's actually uh, the CDC lists only 11 confirmed cases when it's 12. But you can see that a number of other people uh, who were under investigation have been ruled out as SARS. And there's still a number of people being actively followed to see, excuse me, of the, the novel coronavirus. And there's still people under investigation uh, by the CDC in a variety of locations around the world, uh, around the country. Um, now, um, my friend Nick Jewell has already pointed out to me some of the challenges with modeling. Uh, I already knew some of the challenges. I just didn't understand the mathematics underneath them. Um, but, but there are a number of groups that are doing sophisticated modeling to try and make projections of how many cases there might really be in the world, uh, how many infections there might be in the world, projecting things into the future. And those numbers are pretty grim. Uh, frankly, so this estimate was about uh, 75 to 100,000 cases in China by January 25th. By this estimate, well, that was two weeks ago, um, and, and uh, I'm told that more recent uh, projections, in fact, from some modelers, are substantially greater than that. And Nick maybe can can speak to that um, later on. So we're talking about large numbers of people. Many numbers are pretty good. Uh, frankly. So this estimate was about 75 to 100,000 cases in China by January 25th, by this estimate. Um, this is just to say that uh, we, we know that um, you can be asymptomatically infected um, and, and, we, and, and never have symptoms and recover, become uh, uninfected, uh, clearing the infection, uh, that you can have a mild self-limited febrile respiratory infection, but clearly you can have a life-threatening pulmonary infection. And then there's a lot of question about what the case fatality proportion is with estimates ranging from 1% to 3%, but everyone recognizing that that's undoubtedly uh, uh, ch challenging to estimate because deaths may be missed, uh, milder cases may be missed, so it's really very hard to know at this point what the case fatality is. Um, treatment, well, of course, supportive care for people with respiratory failure. I'm not a clinician anymore, but we have some in the audience who could answer fancy questions about uh, uh, supportive people with pulmonary failure and the like. Um, there are clearly lots of headlines about medications that are being used to treat these patients, including antiviral drugs and even antiretroviral drugs. And um, you can see headlines like this, that these drugs are showing efficacy. But I would point out that this is based on individual patients being treated and getting better, and they might have gotten better anyway, right? So rumor has it the Chinese are doing a randomized trial of a couple of different regimens, but it's going to be a while until we know if any of these treatments really has a, a major impact on, on the course of this infection. Um, so here are some things for epidemiologists. The incubation period appears to be in the range of 2 to 14 days. Um, I think all of us in epidemiology are quite certain that this can be spread through droplets and perhaps aerosols. Aerosols are tiny particles that can remain suspended in the air. Uh, I could hit my dean with particles, I mean with droplets from here, but, but droplets are large and fall to the ground by gravity. Aerosols stay suspended in the air. And for respiratory infections, we're often not sure whether both of these are plausible or not. And I would argue for this infection, that remains to be worked out. It is not clear whether hand-to-hand -hand contact can transmit this virus, but, but uh, skin contact, or what doctors are learning to call fomites, uh, or inanimate objects in the environment, such as toys, uh, cell phones, pointers, uh, things like that. Uh, but but uh, it's possible. Uh, we certainly don't know yet. 
There are certainly reports that the virus can be present in the nose and throat for one to two days before symptoms begin, which is true for influenza and a number of other viral respiratory <coughs> pathogens, so that's quite plausible. Uh, a, a major question whether you can transmit this virus when you are not coughing and sneezing. And we can talk about that, but I would just say that the report from Germany suggesting that that happened there has now been questioned. Um, and, and I think that the, uh, we really don't know whether asymptomatic people uh, can transmit this virus. And uh, the R sub zero, the R naught for this has been estimated to be between about one and a half and four. Um, but uh, clearly uh, that basically means the major question whether you can transmit this virus or you are not coughing one infection. And we can talk about that, but I just, just to provide some context, so I took this from the New York Times, but it's, it's pretty useful. Right, so along the y-axis is the case fatality, so how sick does this make you, what are your chances of dying, and along the x-axis are how transmissible it is by its R0, so you can see the king of transmissibility right here is measles at about 15, um, uh, you can see that SARS was over here at about uh, two and a half, although it varied with the time of the epidemic. And so you can see that this uh, coronavirus, this novel coronavirus, is generally in that range um, uh, of somewhere in the range of two, three, something like that. Okay? And if you ask, what does that really mean? It means that this virus is readily transmissible from one person to another and quite capable of causing widespread infection and a very large epidemic. Um, so what is, what is the world doing in terms of prevention and control methods? Well, I've put together my limited list so far. Okay, some people have said the Chinese should have closed down the live animal markets a long time ago. Uh, presumably they're in the process of doing that now. Um, you see people spraying, uh, uh, people walking around spraying street corners and hallways and the like with chemicals. I'm doubtful that that's an effective strategy, but it may reassure people. Uh, we, we do promote hand washing as an important public health tool for a variety of reasons, and that's certainly being promoted. Social distancing means basically canceling events and telling people not to go shopping, not to go into crowds, uh, reducing contact with people. Clearly, there are now a lot of travel restrictions and border closings in place. Uh, uh, lots of people buying, wearing, and hoarding masks. And we can talk about the effectiveness of those masks to prevent in, in protecting you. Um, so for those who care about the distinction, what's been done to Wuhan technically is not quarantine, it's what's called cordon sanitaire. If you don't understand French, that means sanitary cordon. So um, pretty easy. Uh, and what it basically means is you totally surround the area, you let no one in and no one out because there are p infected people and you hope to prevent further transmission. So it's really not individual level quarantine or isolation, it's isolating an entire community. Okay, and that's what the Chinese have tried to do with Wuhan, as I understand it. Isolation is what we do of someone who is sick. So if you're in the hospital with tuberculosis, we isolate you until you're not infectious. Quarantine is what we do to apparently healthy people who might be incubating the disease. So the terms are not interchangeable, even though everyone uses them interchangeably. Um, so um, you now know that we have, I believe, uh, three uh, plane loads of people been brought back from China, two more are due this week. Uh, those people, the federal government for the first time in 50 years is imposing a federal quarantine on those people. Quarantining 300 people is a non-trivial undertaking, so they're all being put on military bases uh, where they can have a place to sleep and someone can feed them and they can basically be kept from leaving. Um, and so the federal government has the legal authority to keep them from leaving and they will be tested regularly to make sure none of them has coronavirus and they're going to be there for 14 days, uh, I'm quite certain. Um, at the same time, we now have multiple cruise ships uh, that appear to have had one or more cases and they are now uh, basically floating quarantine stations of the kind we used to have 100 years ago. Uh, and it's a lot easier to impose quarantine on 2,000 people on a cruise ship because you don't let them back. You don't let them off. You don't let anyone on except people helicoptering in more food. So sort of easy to do in that sense. Um, I just want to point out that uh, the idea of keeping sick people out, oh, I'm sorry, I should have just said one other thing. Um, uh, we also sometimes have what's called protective sequestration. Nobody ever talks about that in public health. But instead of surrounding an area where there are sick people and not letting one, anyone in or out, this is surrounding a healthy community and not letting anyone in who might introduce the infection. 
Okay? And so uh, it's not done very often. But this is an example from the polio epidemic of 1916, basically saying that no child under the age of 16 could enter this town for fear that they might introduce the polio virus. This was also done in the flu pandemic of 1918, where small towns would prohibit entry by anyone from outside in an effort to keep the virus from getting in. So this is not new. Uh, the, you know, how well we in, as you might introduce the infection. Okay. Population. And so, uh, it's not done very often, but this is an example from lots of people are wearing masks, so you might have a hard time buying masks these days in many places. Um, this is a really uh, interesting use of, of modern technology here in China, so a drone will fly over you in China, and if it detects that you are not wearing a mask, it will yell at you. It will take your picture and using facial recognition technology, the government can figure out that you, so-and-so, did not wear a mask and you were potentially in big trouble. Now, I don't think, I hope we're not going to start using that technology here, but that apparently is being done in China. Okay? Um, you can see that um, uh, we've got events at college campuses being canceled uh, because of concerns about bringing crowds together. That's about. Um, we now do, as I've already said, we've got travel restrictions in place, which we can talk about. Um, basically, uh, flights to and, to and from China from virtually every country are now being prohibited um, by many countries. Um, we do have a WHO declared global health emergency. Um, exactly what that means, we can talk about. It it's basically doesn't necessarily mean there are more resources. Uh, available, but it's, it's meant to be an important declaration that the, world, that the world has a serious problem, and it's meant to help raise resources. Um, vaccine development, well, this is the list I could put together of organizations that are busy making a vaccine. There are probably a dozen more that I don't know about or haven't read about. Um, they're taking various different approaches, and some of them are talking about having a vaccine ready in six months. I personally find that a little hard to believe for a variety of reasons, but, but Maybe someone with technology experience in the audience can convince me I'm wrong. But even once you start producing a vaccine, uh, it would be good to test it, make sure it's safe, immunogenic. Um, so even if you could produce large quantities quickly, uh, there, there clearly has to be some testing done before you would uh, start giving it to large numbers of people. Uh, diagnostic tests, initially the testing in the United States had to be done at CDC, so all the samples for those people under investigation had to be sent to Atlanta, imposing a, a, some additional delay in the results. As of yesterday, the California Department of Public Health has its kits. CDC has distributed kits to all 50 state health departments and other public health agencies. And the state of California, as I understand it, will be able to do the testing next week, now that they have the kits. Um, in addition, of course, uh, uh, the, the academic centers and, and, and uh, biotech companies are busy developing tests, point of care diagnostics and the like. So that's a rapidly evolving area. Um, what are some of the social and societal impacts? Well, if you really want to about social and societal impacts from a plague, I suggest you read Albert Camus' The Plague. Um, I've been rereading it this week. It's a really depressing book, but, but quite a good description of how society can dissolve. Uh, in the midst of, a, of a, an anxiety-producing, life-threatening plague. Um, but clearly there are concerns about uh, the effects of reduced travel and trade. Um, I would point out that SARS was estimated to produce an economic uh, impact of something like $70 billion globally, and it's likely this outbreak is going to cause a much bigger global impact than SARS did. So enormous economic impacts. Uh, we've got hoarding of masks. We've got problems with people uh, Asia, from Asia or Asian Americans being stigmatized uh, here uh, and many other places, so stigma is a problem. Uh, we clearly, if you read letters to the editor, uh, have reduced trust in authority if it wasn't low enough to begin with. Um, and of course, in some countries, there are political ramifications. Um, you know, in China, certainly, uh, this is a major political problem for the government of China. Um, so, just to say, um, there's an example of stocks. Of course, stocks go up and down. Oil prices are currently going down. Uh, here's just a few headlines. Anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, uh, our secretary of something said maybe this would be good for the U.S. economy because we'd bring back all the work from China to the United States. That was generally viewed as an unhelpful comment. Um, 
you, you can see that now, as of yesterday, China is reportedly clamping down on news coverage, which is a very unfortunate uh, uh, circumstance. So lots and lots of things happening. Um, the head of WHO, the Secretary General, yesterday put out a plan asking for $675 million to fund the global response. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure whether Bill Gates will write that big of a check, but presumably some organizations will help provide WHO the resources it needs to ramp up its response. Um, and then, of course, people say this is basically a pandemic. And I would simply point out that we do have a technical definition for the word pandemic, and you can decide for yourself whether you think this meets the definition of a pandemic. Some people would argue it doesn't. I would say that it's a distinction without a difference at this point, because functionally uh, we have multiple parts of the world uh, under serious threat, uh, and we are going to treat it like a pandemic even if it doesn't meet this definition. So. Um, I would simply point out that while I think our public health agencies at the local, state, and federal level are doing as good a job as anyone could possibly ask them to do, um, they are hamstrung, as we'll talk about in terms of detection and, and response to pandemics, uh, by a shrinking budget, uh, uh, the elimination of a variety of federal programs under the current administration, uh, and, and reduced resources both globally uh, for, global, for support of other countries. Uh, in this type of response, as well as for activities by the CDC here domestically. So, I think we're doing a great job, but, but um, some of you may know Laurie Garrett is a famous writer um, about the, the crumbling public health infrastructure, uh, graduate of Berkeley, in immunology. Um, so, we can talk about that. So, my summary, my last slide, this is clearly a newly emergent infectious disease. The situation is, is evolving very rapidly. There are, it's pointing out, again, enormous gaps in the global capacity to prepare for, predict, detect, and respond to such infections. And the world has a lot of work to do. So, thank you. How are we doing at Berkeley? Oh, wow. <laughs> So first of all, I'm really privileged to be here, and I want to say right up front that I am not an expert in infectious diseases or in public health. I'm a general internal medicine physician. I happen to love a lot of things connected to those areas, as you heard, but I am absolutely deferring to the experts on all the scientific questions here. Um, and we've been talking on and off over the last few weeks already, and I'll continue to do so. That said, um, I have a position of responsibility on this campus, and so they asked me to come. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to because my, my primary responsibility is to actually make sure that we're staying safe, but I, I'm here. This is a little sort of last minute and off the fly, so I'll just say a few words and then I think the rest could be in the form of a QA. and a um, so, um, so first of all, and I don't wear a suit only either, by the way. So first of all, um, we, just in case those of you don't know, I just want to say a few words about UHS and what we do. So we care for the students on campus, obviously. Um, we care for students regardless of their insurance. We also have a limited role in terms of faculty staff. We do the occupational health for faculty and staff, as well as disability management and a few other things. And then we're sort of the unofficial, I think it's unofficial, health officer for the campus when things happen which is a great place to be in terms of being in the firing line sometimes. Um, but we actually take that really, really seriously and spend a lot of our time, even when things aren't happening, to make sure that we're making the connections and building the relationships that we need to have in place. So so in in right now, and that is mainly the public health department. So I have a very strong relationship with the Berkeley City of Berkeley Public Health Department. We are under the jurisdiction of the city here. Um, which is unusual in America. We're also part of Alameda County. We're also, of course, part of the state of California and then on a larger basis of the, the, the country. And one of the interesting things I always learn is that everyone doesn't agree about things. And we are officially basically beholden to follow the rules of our local public health jurisdiction, which isn't necessarily a bad thing at all, but it means that those are the folks who really make the decisions legally about things like quarantine and isolation and so forth. That said, we ask questions, we talk a lot, and ever since this whole thing began, um, I've been talking to Public Health Daily. We as a system have been talking amongst ourselves across the UC system at least every other day. 
medical directors, all of us, we get we talk to each other all the time because we want to really consult with each other and have a cohesive response whenever possible. And then we also talk a lot with the campus leaders, especially within the fields of environmental health and safety, obviously police, obviously communications and media, um, and also escalating things to the higher administration when necessary. And that's part of my job is to make sure people start paying attention when I'm concerned that a public health safety issue is emerging. So we do that probably more often than people realize, which is a good thing. Um, I, we do also deal with isolation of a communicable disease multiple times a month, but I don't talk about it very much. So we have existing processes in place both to handle it on the front line and to escalate as needed. All of that said, emergency preparedness is a challenging field. This campus has been a little challenged over the last few years, and the public health department is insanely underfunded, and so when I say partnering, it literally is saying, okay, you have two nurses, I have one nurse, who's gonna go knock on the door? So um, there are huge challenges here, and I, I just wanna echo that, and thank you for saying that. I'm a big fan of public health. So more specifically, what we have done on this campus, ever since this started emerging, so I guess I probably became aware of it around, I think it might've been New Year's or so, um, we pulled some people together, we reviewed things like our supplies for personal protective equipment, and yes, the mask is a whole other topic that I have strong feelings around, um, and uh, hand sanitizers and all the rest. But honestly, that is not usually a huge concern right up front, because we have a stockpile that we keep in place for those situations. Um, more importantly, we start thinking about the staffing, and we start making sure that we are being thoughtful about our messaging. And so one of the things I can't do is speculate a lot in my messaging because obviously there's a lot of fear and anxiety out there and I want to be fact-based and clear and as calming as I can be while being realistic. That's actually a huge part of our job too is, the, is handling that piece of things. I love that we get to talk about the science and the medicine more in here, so I'm looking forward to that part. Um, then as it started becoming clear that um, this was expanding rapidly. Um, we start talking about things like making sure we have isolation spaces on campus, which we do. Um, we don't have enough if this hits a huge way, but we are already exploring those options if we need to. Um, we make sure that everyone's in agreement on the appropriate uh, airflow and hygiene control and all those kinds of things. And that we talk to our, our fellows over in the dining halls and the dorms and, and the international students who we've been reaching out to quite a bit because they've been very impacted by this, as you can imagine. We filled questions as they come and we consult with our colleagues who are experts. Currently, uh, we have been assessing the entire month um, for people who are coming back from China and not. Um, we've been closely following CDC guidelines as we always do but also throwing in a little clinical judgment here and there, which means we call the public health officer if we you know, are a little worried and it doesn't quite fit. We'd rather be cautious. Um, we have, I will say, we have done some testing. I'm not gonna talk about how many and all the rest, but that's sort of confidential information. We have not had any cases here, thank goodness. So I've been really happy with that. And honestly, if we hadn't been doing testing and hadn't been doing screening, I would have been surprised and if people say they're not doing that and they're not paying attention. So um, this is part of our routine work. Um, right now I'm you know, sort of waiting, there's like this little calm, a little lull happening and I'm waiting for something local to happen, I'm just gonna say. Um, we've been lucky thus far, but um, we will be most definitely escalating as we do. And we are activated at the, at the EOC, so the Emergency Operations Center on campus, as well as through the system, as well as at UHS. So I'll stop now and then I'm sure other questions will come up. Thank you. I guess it was passed back in the morning. I for uh, both of those uh, presentations. I think that was incredibly informative um, and I'm excited to dive into this topic. Um, I wanted to just get right to it. I mean, you kind of talked about some of the um, challenges in, in these outbreaks, and there are a lot of challenges, but I wanted to start with kind of the early stages and that sort of, even sort of identifying these, these outbreaks when they occur, what are the challenges there? Um, why are they hard? Can, can we even predict them? Um, and why is it so hard to 
do the surveillance to even identify them right away. I mean, this was actually pretty quick, is my understanding. Um, you know, presumably the first cases in China were at the beginning of December, and then they were really publicized by the end of December, and then now we're, you know, two months into it, I suppose. Um, but that still is a month before there was really any publicity about this brand new coronavirus. Um, can you talk about why that's a challenge? Why is that so hard to do? So, so, so first, I think if you read the newspapers, you'll know there's a, a fair bit of back and forth about how transparent China was uh, with regard to uh, the, this, and certainly reports that, that there may have been delays um, in China. Now, some discussion about whether those were uh, primarily at the uh, at the, le at the local level of people being unhappy or unwilling uh, to share information with the national authorities. So I personally can't tell what, what went on there. I think there, you know, certainly in SARS there was a great lack of transparency, which contributed to delays and, and to a, a bigger problem. I think leaving that question aside, I think the, the more interesting epidemiologic question is. Uh, how do we do a better job of detect? Well, so I guess there are two issues. One is uh, uh, predicting, for example, when uh, what, which viruses in animals might be more likely to come out and get us, if you will. And, and I'll be happy to talk at length about why I think that's particularly problematic. Um, but, but beyond that, the question of can we detect clusters of illness, uh, unusual illness, unusual clusters more rapidly than we do? And of course, the old-fashioned surveillance method of either laboratories or doctors reporting things that we have in the United States is notoriously imperfect. Um, it, it certainly is problematic for detecting a completely new uh, infectious disease. There's lots of interest in what's called syndromic surveillance, which I'd be happy to talk about, uh, or, or using artificial intelligence or a variety of big data approaches uh, to finding clusters uh, you know, here or there that you can then respond to more quickly as opposed to waiting for doctors to tell you about something. Um, I, I'm actually somewhat skeptical about how well those things can work, uh, and it's in part because particularly in the countries where these are most likely to uh, emerge, such as in countries in sub-Saharan Africa, such as the, the Ebola problem, the infrastructure is very poor, um, and there aren't many trained individuals so someone sitting in Geneva with a powerful computer uh, might be able to find what we call signals, but, but a lot of the signals, when followed up, actually won't be very interesting. Um, and so, and somebody on the ground has to actually follow them up and see, is this actually a problem? Uh, there needs to be diagnostic laboratory capabilities. China is certainly capable of doing that, at least in the big cities. Uh, I don't know about the more remote parts of China. But it's, it's not easy, and it's not easy to do in the places where these are most likely to leap from animals to people. So uh, I, I think those are some of the challenges that we have without getting too into the woods. I do just have to add that, of course, this emerged during the middle of our flu season here as well, and we have a lot, a lot of flu going on, as always, and so, which is probably inevitable, but that makes it that much more complicated to identify based on symptoms when we don't have rapid testing. Yeah, that's a, a really important point. Um, and kind of taking it to the next level, then, in terms of the challenges of the, of the public health response, which is something that you both talked about, um, in terms of resources, um, and also just, this is something that changes hour to hour. I mean, I, you know, I'm a journalist and I cannot keep up with it. I mean, I don't even really try to keep up with it hour to hour, but I can't imagine what the challenges are from a public health response. Um, and you can see that in, in how we've, we've responded to this in the United States. Um, you know, this kind of upstaging of, um, of restrictions, right, to go from, I mean, for a long time, you know, we were just doing these screenings at the airports, which even the CDC sort of acknowledged weren't very effective, um, just because of how you, how do you funnel people through the airports, and, you know, just because people aren't feverish when they get off the plane doesn't mean that they're not out in the community, um, and then now we're at the point of quarantining entire planes of people, um, so I think there's a lot of confusion out in the public about, why we're at the stage we're at now, um, and why some things are being done and other things aren't being done. Um, can you talk about how do you mount a public health response 
um, when things are changing so rapidly, so much is unknown, and then also, and this is a big topic, but incorporating you know the resources and some of the challenges you you face in terms of just you know having everything that you need at your fingertips. So first, I want to go back to a point I made that, that public health is basically local. So, so the idea that we'll send out large numbers of federal employees to do X, Y, and Z in a county or in a state, uh, yes, the CDC is capable of mobilizing teams of people and sending them. I used to be on those teams. Um, but, but fundamentally, the work has to be done at the local level uh, with support from the state. Um, so we're really dependent on our our politicians and our taxpayers supporting a robust public health infrastructure, which is easy to neglect when nothing is going wrong. Uh, it's an easy budget to cut, um, and there doesn't appear to be a problem until there's a problem. Um, so, so I do think, A, we rely on, on our public health workforce and our clinicians uh, to, to be involved in different pieces of this. But in terms of should we isolate these people, should we test those people, should we quarantine these people or stop travel. The reality is that the states and the locals look to guidance from CDC. We are Centers for Disease Control, and I admit since I used to work there and still do a lot of work with them, I'm, I'm not, and my wife still works there, um, I, I'm not unbiased, but it is, it is a unique organization. There's nothing like it anywhere in the world. It really has extraordinary capabilities in the laboratory and in epidemiology and experts on every conceivable, certainly infectious disease. So. The idea that a state would potentially do something quite different than what the CDC recommends at a given point in time, I think is, you know, there are reasons to, to think that might not be the best thing to do. But obviously, if a state wanted to do something more robust, uh, more restrictive, uh, they have the legal authority. I think everyone in the room should understand that laws concerning health are state laws. So the imposition of federal quarantine, that's the first time we've done that since a smallpox case 60 years ago. And the last time before that was in the context of, of um, back in the flu pandemic of 1918. So the federal government has the authority to quarantine people, but the reality is that these types of, of impositions of restricting people's movements, screening them, et cetera, are basically state functions. Um, but states certainly look for federal guidance to the CDC, and I would argue that that's a good thing to do. We'd like the policies to be more or less uniform and to be based on the best science. But of course, as the science or the knowledge evolves, <coughs> intelligent people will potentially change their, uh, you know, what they recommend. Uh, and of course, they also have to take into account anxiety and, and, and potential panic uh, reassuring the public and things like that. So sometimes they're on the side of being more restrictive or doing you know things that are more expensive uh, because it's important in terms of the psychological situation. But, but, but it's clearly a complicated picture. I just want to add, so the way that they manage despite not having the resources in part is by partnering with others. So that's why building these relationships is so critical. We're essentially the foot soldiers here on campus for the public health department. I consider myself an extension of the public health department in many ways. And um, we have our limited resources as well, but they're really managing their under-resourcing by building up really strong communications and, really, and relationships with the local um, health systems so that we are immediately alerted. And honestly, the way that this is for me right now is um, I'm being texted constantly by various public health people and campus people to make sure we're always on the same page and we're staying abreast of the communications. And then we rely on the communications, for example, out to campus, to advise people to monitor themselves a lot instead of quarantine and isolating, which is consistent with CDC right now, because we need people to be taking some ownership as well, honestly, given the resources that we have. The problem we have is not everybody reads emails and all the rest of it. So, you know, finding different ways to reach different populations is really important. Well, and I'll say um, from my standpoint as a, as a journalist, one of the challenges that, and I know that you guys in public health really face this a lot, is, you know, on the one hand, we have some pretty dramatic actions happening, right, at the airports, um, you know, they're restricting travel and now quarantining people, and that's, this is big stuff. And then at the same time, there's this consistent message of, but the public is at low risk. 
Um, and I certainly run into that and you know, in, in the newspaper all the time is how do you sort of convey that this is a very serious thing that we should take very seriously, but at the same time, don't worry. Um, and I mean, we've even internally had a problem where we had to talk where um, some reporters who don't cover health kept referring to this as the deadly coronavirus. And it's not that it's not deadly, but it's not like we describe, you know, the deadly influenza or, you know, we refer to any sort of virus or pathogen that can kill you as the deadly whatever. So I mean, there's just, you know, wording and phrasing, and I know that's something you guys run into all the time. Um, playing off of that, you know, one of the things that I'm, as, as we're getting more information on this now, you know, we're looking at potentially what, like about a 2% or even lower um, mortality rate with this. And I've certainly been hearing now increasingly from people saying, if this is, you know, essentially influenza, if this is essentially even maybe milder illness as we get more cases um, and that, that percentage changes, and now we're, we're having, you know, hundreds of people in quarantine. At what point do we say this is, we're overreacting? You know, maybe, um, you know, we don't need to be taking these kinds of extremes. Why, why is it so important to take these really sort of dramatic um, efforts to prevent this thing from getting a toehold in this country if it's, you know, not that serious? <laughs> I don't know how to phrase that better than that, but, but, but what's, what's kind of the answer to that to people who ask that question? So I think there are certainly people in the room who know more about risk communication than I do. Um, it's a really important part of public health. Um, you know, trying to balance uh, the information so that you're giving people a, a good message that looks at what are the risks and benefits and why you're doing the various things you're doing. Um, you, you know, I, I don't, that's not easy. So one of the things I do every night is I read the letters to the editor of the New York Times people responding to these different articles. And, you know, just as in another field I work in vaccination, you see an astonishing range of points of view. So, you know, people who say, what are you worried about? It's only killed a few hundred people so far. That's nothing compared to smoking or whatever it is, right? And other people who say, shut the door. Don't let any of those people in. This is a worldwide catastrophe. And, and you know, and, and everything in between, right? So in the general public, we have all manner of different points of view about this, and the challenge for public health is to do the best job of balancing, uh, you know, not creating undue panic, uh, but, but trying to protect the public's health. And, and I would argue that the whole point of all this exercise, if you're a wealthy country like the United States, is in fact to prevent a situation that exists in Wuhan at the moment. We do not want widespread uh, transmission of this virus in the United States. Uh, even if it, quote, only kills 1% to 2% of the people who get sick with it, we prefer not to have that. So if we can, through some of these activities, prevent that from happening, um, maybe a, a year we'll have a vaccine, and then we'll have the interesting question of, should we use the vaccine? To whom should we give the vaccine? You know, et, et cetera, et cetera, right? But that would be a luxury uh, that we would have, uh, you know, a year from now or 18 months from now. So, so part of it is trying to see if we can keep, keep things out uh, because you can see the kind of panic and economic harm that, that, that this kind of illness can, can produce. But, but you're right, getting the balance right between undue panic and anxiety. Uh, you know, it's clear that some people don't like being reminded to get a flu shot in the middle of all this, right? <laughs> we all in public health say, by the way, if you want to protect yourself from the respiratory infections, we have a not so good, but better than nothing flu vaccine, and you should get it because it's flu season and flu kills more people than blah, 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 right? People, there are a lot of people who are not happy with that message, even though it's a fully accurate message, right? Um, so I don't know if we have a hand up there, if you want to. Yeah, there are a few hands up, so I don't, <laughs> um, we're ready to handle that, I'm fine. Totally fine with me, I, you know, we, we don't have to keep laughing with each other. We can... <laughs> Uh, from a medical perspective, why is the virus so deadly? What, what happens? So we can repeat the question, but nobody has the answer. <laughs> 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 but why is the virus so deadly from a medical perspective? Do you want to take first pass? You want me to? Either way, I mean, I'll tell you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I can tell you as a pure clinician right now, and then anyone who wants to add much more interesting detail can. 
My understanding is that you, there are a certain percentage of people who end up with essentially an inflammatory response in their lungs and they end up with a pneumonia, but it's not a typical bacterial pneumonia. And I don't think we know why some people or who necessarily is getting sick with this, although there has been some speculation, and this is where I pass it off. I also think we'll know a lot more really soon because a lot of people are studying it. Do you want to speculate some more? Yeah. So, so I would guess that pretty much the entire human race is susceptible to infection with this virus. I don't know any reason why people would be immune to it unless you know they've been exposed to a very similar virus and there's cross protection. So I would assume that most of us are susceptible to infection with this virus. Uh, and as is true for pretty much most respiratory viruses, some people will be asymptomatically infected, some will develop a mild self-limited illness, some will get really sick, and some will die. And that's just a continuum. It's pretty clear at the moment that at least in China, the overwhelming proportion of the deaths are in older adults. I'll use the term older adults, old people like me. Um, uh, you know, but particularly those who have underlying medical conditions, which is exactly what we see with influenza, right? So in that sense, it may be no different than influenza in terms of who's likely to get really sick and be hospitalized and die. One of the interesting things that's an unknown is, is how many children are getting sick. And at the moment, the data would suggest that as with true with SARS, very few children are getting diagnosed. And most people are saying that that's because they probably aren't getting very sick and no one is uh, testing it. And I'm sure that that's part of it. But at least with SARS, and probably with this, if you think about how it started, it, it almost certainly started in an adult exposed into a bat or to a, you know, a pound civet or whatever it was. And we tend to think more of children infecting adults than adults infecting children. And so how much children have hung around wet markets? How much they've been exposed to sick adults who were bedridden? Maybe a cultural phenomenon? But I'm not sure whether children are being equally exposed. But if they are, then they clearly are not getting as sick as adults, right? But that's very common for respiratory pathogens. Eva. Eva has a virology answer. No, 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 just, this is not the virology. It's just that I've just heard that it is moving down into like the 30s. So there's, no, there's, I haven't talked to Aubrey one minute ago. Um, no, just that it's now moving down in the age range. So there's more severe cases in the 30s range because the latest news. So. Okay. A distinguished vaccinologist in the audience. Well, um, actually, a different question for you, for the distinguished epidemiologist. Uh, the question I had is those people on the boat, which you listed as being quarantined, and I want to understand the logic there because the, they start out with one case. Now I think there's five or six. And do those people stay on the boat till they're either all <laughs> zero positive or all dead, or uh, how do you do that? because each time there's a new case? You have to sort of start the window over that again in terms of keep keeping people. So, what would you recommend if you were in charge of that boat? <laughs> so, let me begin by saying what my wife always tells me, okay? <laughs> which is that it's people in public health who do public health. Professors just talk about it. <laughs> okay? It's people in public health agencies who have the responsibility for making those tough decisions, and not professors. No, because of professors there. Okay. So, I mean, the, the point you're raising is obviously good, but it's also true in what apparently is being done in Wuhan uh, in terms of put it, forcibly putting together large numbers of people, uh, some of whom may be incubating this virus and some of whom may not, some of whom may have influenza, and you put them all together in a tight space and guess what? You might be promoting transmission within that area and dooming some people to infection who might otherwise not have gotten infected. And there's certainly a concern about that. So, you know, I guess, first of all, I, I, and I'm sure this is all true, I, I'm sure people uh, are being checked regularly for symptoms. Uh, I, I would uh, hope that people who are symptomatic are wearing masks and getting as quick a testing as possible. Um, and, you know, the people are doing their best to, to try and uh, uh, not infect other people while they wait out their incubation period in utter boredom. Uh, you know, shuffle board only gets you so far. Um, I, you know, I, there, are no, there are no drugs we can give people. There's obviously a concern about having people get off the boat and go to Tokyo or 
you know, wherever it is, um, and, and try to follow them there. But, but this is clearly one of the problems with quarantine, right? Quarantining large numbers of individuals and it is just really hard. And if, you know, you either post a guard outside their door and you provide all of their, for all of their needs in their apartment, because you don't let them leave, right? Uh, or you put them all on military base and try and ensure that as little transmission is occurring as possible. I, I don't really have a good answer, and I don't know exactly what to do. Um, <laughs> I just want to pick me up. Professor Jewell. Yeah, I just want to correct the information so that he, there's two boats under quarantine right now. The Diamond Princess in Yokohama has about 4,000 people on board, 3,700 to be exact. There are currently 20 confirmed infections on that ship. They've all been removed to uh, isolation in hospitals in Japan. Um, about 10% of them have been test of the other passengers have been tested because they're showing symptoms. And as other people have pointed out, it's the cold and flu season, so that's not a shock. I, I, I can't. I, I can quote on an, an one source, but I, that a third of those people are have tested positive as of 10 hours ago. So that, that takes it up from 20 potentially high. But the media. Officially, there's only 20 people. So they're literally having to wait out because that infection clearly spread within that ship yeah. before it was quarantined. And now they have to wait for the incubation period before they can allow people. <coughs> but they haven't tested everyone. There's a lot of people on that ship who are showing no symptoms and are just so stuck <laughs> so far. Um, I wanted to ask, how is this response different or similar to the response to SARS? Uh, you mean globally or China or here or globally? So, so I think people were sobered by the SARS experience. Um, you know, the hope was that, that the Chinese response was more transparent and, 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 and less obstructed than the SARS experience. As I said, I think that remains to be fully elucidated. What happened in China, if it's ever known for sure. I, I would say that, that the, the, this response is, at least internationally so far, uh, more robust um, because of the experience with SARS and because of an increased concern about problems like this. Um, but I'm not sure that there's any data to support that statement, and, and so I'm not totally sure that that's true. Um, you know, the world community can sometimes world work move fairly slowly. Um, you know, the world the World Health Organization is another great example of an organization that, in theory, uh, should be able to do an astonishing amount in a situation like this, but in practice, uh, it doesn't have that many staff, doesn't have that much money. Um, and, and, and really is limited in its capabilities. So they have to ask someone to give them money. And how long will it take for someone to write the checks? I don't know. But in the meantime, their capacity is, is really quite limited. And, and so they often, for example, rely on partners like the CDC in Atlanta. Uh, if, because if they need to, CDC can send 500 uh, medical epidemiologists. And in fact, they're doing that. Um, not to China so far. No oh, thanks. Um, so, so the World Health Organization is constrained by its limited resources and having to wait for, for, for people. They don't have hundreds of people sitting there in Geneva waiting to get on a plane. Um, you know, but, but I think people are not worried about enough about this, but the response, I would say, has been perhaps a little better than the response to service, but others may have a different view. Um, I'll just add that from a, whoa, from a local perspective, I found in a box a few weeks ago the 2003 SARS Emergency Preparedness Plan. And so I will say that at least locally, that experience did help things move faster here. So we do live and learn a little bit. Um, just a real quick um, from my perspective in the media, I wasn't covering it at the time, but I did actually spend the last couple days, few days, looking through our own archives of how the Chronicle covered that. Um, and one thing that was remarkable to me is it felt like just reading the articles that there was a lot more chaos with SARS, a lot more sort of 
there was there was one incident where um, a plane landed in San Jose and five passengers. The, the pilot reported that he thought there were there were cases of SARS on the plane, and so they had it at the at the tar on the tarmac. You know, ambulances surrounding it. They took these pa these passengers off the plane, brought them to the hospital. It turned out they had colds. I mean, the people had been sick in Tokyo with with colds. But there was this sort of like not panic, but really chaotic response. And there were several examples of those kinds of incidents where it was clear that it was just, there was a lot, there was a big range of the way public health agencies responded to it from county to county that doesn't seem to be the case to me this time around. It feels a lot more focused, um, a lot more consistent, um, and consistent messaging and things like that. So I thought that was kind of um, just in a glance over the articles, it felt to me like it was a very different response. One more thing to add, just anecdotally, um, I think the the effect of SARS is still felt many places in the world, in China in particular, and so we did have a number of students who came forward quite early who were much more panicked than they might have been because their parents had handled SARS, and so therefore presented earlier, which is actually a good thing from a public health perspective that we could engage with them sooner. So I think it has helped, again, get things moving faster and more carefully. If, if this outbreak were to occur in the U.S., what steps would you recommend our government take, balancing on transparency, public safety, and anxiety? Second question, is our, public, uh, is our health system ready to face this challenge? So, so I, I'm hoping we won't use drones to identify people who are not wearing masks and, you know, and, and identify them individually. Um, so I'm hoping we won't get to that stage here. Um, you know, I think what we would be doing uh, under guidance from CDC and, you know, and, and local partners and, and, and clinical organizations would be uh, pretty much what is already being done but on a much larger scale, right? So we would be testing much larger numbers of people for this virus. Uh, we would be isolating uh, people if we suspected that they were infected. We might be quarantining people. Uh, there are a lot of questions about whether we would be canceling sporting events and, and large gatherings and graduations and, you know, things like that. I think, uh, you know, there might be circumstances where people would get that concern that they would do that. But I'm not sure there'd be an enormous difference from what we're doing now, but it would just be a much, much larger scale. If you're asked the question, do, are we, do we have the clinical capacity to deal with the problem that China is experiencing in Wuhan at the moment? If that's your question, the answer is no. Right? We have spent the last 20 years reducing the number of hospitals, the number of hospital beds, the capacity, because it costs money to have excess hospital capacity. Right? So if all of a sudden large metropolitan areas like New York or San Francisco had thousands of people coming in and needing uh, respiratory support in an intensive care unit. I don't know if we have any doctors, real doctors in the room, not like me, but, but <laughs> it would be a problem. We don't have enough respirators. We don't have enough, you know, we're not clear we'd even have enough nurses, right? So no, we don't have enormous excess capacity. We've spent a lot of effort to reduce excess capacity to try and save money on health care costs. The, the reality is that, that if you need to, what did China build two hospitals in 14 days? I don't think we could do that here. Um, whatever the quality of the hospitals is, I think it's hard to envision doing that, right? Um, you know, the military has a limited capacity to quickly set up, uh, uh, you know, care for large, reasonable numbers of people. We're talking about a few hundred people maybe. But 20,000 people needing respiratory support in New York? I don't, I don't think so. Do you still see patients? <laughs> I'm still a real doctor. Um, there was. Oh, sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Switch the mic. Switch the mics back to the other mic. Where's the other mic? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I want to add one other thing, which is actually that one of the things that's most on my mind right now, which is the supply of a lot of our things that we use in these situations, including various kinds of masks. A lot of that comes from China, at least somewhere. And so we are experiencing major problems in this state and likely elsewhere in the United States in terms of not having any access to those supplies. 
really quickly. And, and that, you know, I mean, it's obvious, right, that that would have happened. It's happening. And so one of the biggest things I do is spend time on these uh, state emergency calls saying, we have one week of this left. We have two weeks of this left. We need help. What are you doing about it? Well, how are we escalating the larger public health response to get those supplies? So, you know, that's one of those little nuances of how dependent we are, all of us. So if I might just say, with regard to supplies, many of you know there are, there's a national stockpile uh, of various things. Um, some may not be totally relevant, like we have a dose of smallpox vaccine for everyone in the United States, just in case. Tax uh, dollars hard work. Um, you know, but, but, that, but that national uh, emergency supply includes various antibiotics. Uh, I would be, wouldn't be surprised if it includes, uh, you know, things like masks. Um, and if and when it needs to be deployed, obviously the federal government will, just, will decide to use uh, that emergency supply of various things. So we do have some preparedness, uh, for, you know, for emergencies of a substantial scale, but I honestly don't know how, how long they would last. fast-track the diagnostic uh, kit approval that has just been distributed to the state level. Uh, can you speak to the uh, sensitivity and specificity of that test? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anyone has public data about the sensitivity and specificity of these new tests. Uh, so they're not published. So I'm sorry, but I don't think so. <coughs> Just, just beginning, let me say, I'm from Wuhan, China. I was born there, go up there, and I went to colleges there. So, actually, a couple things I want to just see for, uh, I, it's, it's maybe not official, but the disease, the first case was officially identified in December, beginning of December, but actually in November, in Wuhan, there's already, they say there's a rumor about this strange lung disease lung disease and the SARS like the lung disease. So so then there's a lot of just oh that's a rumor. But I think this is the right thing. I think the lessons we learned from the Wuhan spread, I think number one I really agree with what the art said is the local public health aging is very very important. But what at the beginning of December, what the Wuhan public health actually announced is say there is no person to person you know, uh, uh, the transaction. And when so on that, I thought that at the very early stage, I thought that was a mistake because you didn't know yet. So you shouldn't, you know, uh, alarm. So I think that's one thing. Second, I would say the lessons were learned, but I don't know if we can correct, is bad timing. Because there's a Chinese New Year, it's really bad timing yeah. and there's a big, big, uh, tra you know, trans transportation se uh, seasons. And the the Wuhan closed down was just a little bit too late. I think if Wuhan closed down a little earlier, I think at least we can prevent this global spread. But how could we know? That's what the government said. One other thing I think I would like to say is the death row, now what the public know, or WHO, oh no, I think it is underestimated. The reason is, Okay, it's a really unfortunate reason is it's for my own. I, ha I have family members still in Wuhan. I have friends, a lot of friends there. But what they even say, unless you have a family member get infected, you really don't know the, the, the truth. So I have a really a friend who's telling me one of her friends died from this. From, that, from have the symptoms until die never get a finally diagnosed, never even get into the hospital. Mm -hmm. So which means I'm not blaming any China Chinese government or local government. It's maybe even the local government even didn't know because they just, uh, you know, so this is, I would say it's more urgent the situation. Um, the death row is, is much higher. So that's what I, 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 I want to just make sure. But I think we're here is what we, I actually think is what we can do and what we can learn from, from this lessons. So I would say, um, 
Um, I have just a couple questions for, for art or for any physicians here, because now China change for the diagnosis using PCR kits. It's, it's great, but at the beginning, the reason is two, week, two weeks ago, we, we, they didn't have enough medical supplies, so they didn't have that. So that's why they just had to watch the people die. But now they do have, but it's still not quickly enough. Oh, now they're trying to get everybody in Wuhan who can run the PCR trying to do it, but still very limited. So now they change it to using the the chest, either chest X-ray or chest uh, the CT. So I don't. I'm not a physician. I want to see if that's really good diagnosis. This is the one thing. Another question is how about treatment? Now the treatment they're using the plasma from recovered patients to give to the, yeah, just, I just want to ask you this two questions. By the way, I'm not coming to see if you wear a tie, but I just want to see if I are to wear the mask. If you are to wear the mask, I think you wear. I didn't, even wear a mask. I didn't even wear a mask in Hong Kong during SARS. That's how stupid I am. So, so that, you know, clearly if the case definition they're using is different, uh, that makes it even more confusing in terms of what the true numbers are. Uh, chest x-ray or other non-specific tests like that is clearly not going to be as definitive for, for coronavirus as a coronavirus test. So I think that's just going to confuse matters more. But I think it's very clear that, that a lot of sick people have not been tested. And so it makes it very hard to know what's going on. In terms of using plasma, Clearly, uh, there's an interest in potentially seeing whether plasma from recovered individuals uh, might have an antibody or some other material in it that could be useful therapeutically um, as, and, and potentially then lead to monoclonal antibodies or something like that. So I, I, I'm sure people are trying that, but I have no idea what the results are. The rest have some people over here. But uh, as we know, it's very difficult to predict or prevent such an outbreak. So maybe after the epidemic, it always has a problem with lack of doctors or beds in the hospitals or other medical resources. So in that situation, how could how could we do with those mild patients? Because if they are mild with little or no syndrome, they may be just chosen home in isolation. But this time in Wuhan, there were many cases reported that one person is sick and the whole family infected. So how could we do for these mild patients? Maybe there are the big reason for the epidemic to the transmitted virus and how Hong Kong did in 2003. don't have the answer to your question. Again, clearly if there are lots of people who are mildly ill and not getting diagnosed, it just makes the whole epidemiologic picture even more complicated and difficult to interpret, right? So, so I don't have a good answer to that, but I think that's obvious. You know, I, I think, again, we've said that compared to the SARS response, uh, this one is, is robust, but I think that people in Wuhan are totally overwhelmed, <laughs> frankly. And, and, you know, I'm sure they're doing their best, but, but I'm pretty sure they don't have the capacity to do what someone sitting in a chair in Berkeley would suggest that they do, <laughs> right? So... Here locally, we look for isolation, not with your family, but on your own. And of course, if we get really overwhelmed, that's going to be very challenging, which is why we're anticipating how we can use larger spaces and maintain enough distance. And that is a place where we might use masks for people who are sick. Um, and all the rest of it, but it would be very, very challenging. Some people over there, there's a guy over there. I'm one time. <laughs> Thank you. This is more of an immunology question, and I don't know if it's too early or not relevant, but um, anybody that was previously in infected with SARS, have you seen any protection from this global coronavirus since they're from the same family? I don't know if they might have similar antigens or they might start there with developing a vaccine. So the, 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 the quick answer to that is I have no idea. 
It's a perfectly plausible hypothesis that somebody who's been infected with the SARS coronavirus might have partial or full immunity to this virus. They're relatively closely related. I, I'm pretty sure no one has a clue what the answer to that question is. But it's plausible. We need more microphones. Yeah, state university. You need to get more microphones. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you foresee this will ultimately dissipate, oh, excuse me, um, to the point where the perceived, or more importantly, the actual threat, especially regarding mortality, goes away, maybe to the point that we don't really think so much about SARS or bird flu, for example. <laughs> You're getting your exercise. <laughs> so, so first of all, I think the parallel with bird flu is, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try and make that parallel. Um, bird flu, H5N1, or highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses, are really very different. Um, for two reasons. One, they have an incredibly high case fatality proportion of the range of 50%. So they're really bad when you get them. Uh, but B, you basically need to kiss a chicken uh, in order to get them. I mean, there's basically almost no human-to-human -human transmission of that virus. Um, and, and by the way, I do think that the bird, and there is an outbreak apparently of bird flu at the moment in China as well, which I presume is H5N1, but I suppose it could be a different virus. But actually, I, I do want to say something about bird flu, um, which is that when I was on the WHO advisory committee about immunizations back before the flu pandemic of 2009, people were really worried about bird flu uh, in Vietnam uh, and other South e Southeast Asian countries where there were several hundred cases and 100 deaths or more. And, and so based on the concern that that virus might it, it had two of the three characteristics needed to make up to cause a pandemic, right? One is it really makes people sick. Two is nobody in the human population is immune, but it didn't have the third. The third was transmissibility from person to person, right? But people were so worried about that and predicting that, we made millions of doses of a bird flu vaccine that, as far as I know, were never deployed. And in fact, I emailed my friends in Geneva this morning and said, by the way, is that still in storage or did you flush it down the corner? <laughs> because it, 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 it was way past its shelf life years ago. And it cost tens of millions of dollars to make, and it's never been used. Right? So predicting which viruses are going to cause a pandemic and make vaccines and be prepared and all of that, I'm just saying, I, I think it's a hard thing to do. Okay? So I wouldn't, I, I said I'd be a parallel bird flu, but your other question was, oh, will it dissipate? Well, then, that's certainly, we hope, um, uh, you know, that the, the, the control measures, et cetera, that, that, you know, that whether it becomes an endemic infection, uh, whether it, uh, we have periodic outbreaks, um, whether it goes away like SARS, I think it's too soon to tell. But, it's a little hard for me to see this disappearing completely the way SARS did, given where we're at at the moment. Thank you, Dr. Ryan Gold and um, fellow panelists. Um, how and what policies should be enforced on airline carriers and the larger travel industry if they do not comply with WHO protective measures um, with respect to waiving cancellation penalties and providing full refunds to their passengers? Is there a lawyer in the room? <laughs> no idea. We need about 12 lawyers to answer that question. <laughs> Seriously, you know, we need some people who know serious business law and international law to, to speak to the question of is there any enforcement mechanism? Can you force airlines to give people refunds, et cetera, et cetera? I have no idea. Whether there's legal recourse, I don't know. Any lawyers in the room? In Toronto, during the SARS uh, outbreak, 
there were people who were called super spreaders, which means that R0 is not finite and fixed, but changeable. What did we learn from uh, super spreaders and that concept? And was it a problem of the patient? Or had their immune systems done something to change the virus? Okay. At the, with Nick Jewell in the room, I'm going to attempt to make an answer, but Nick and Natalie can correct me. So, so first of all, R0 is, uh, fundamentally, what we in public health do is try to reduce R0 to less than one, right? So whether it's wearing masks, whether it's vaccinating people, whether it's giving prophylactic medication, whether it's social distancing, we want to get the R0 below one so the epidemic will go away, right? Everything we're doing is focused on that. And, and, and it's almost certainly the case that the R0 was different at different stages of the SARS outbreak, right? Um, the, the, the super spreaders, as I recall, um, certainly some of them uh, were fundamentally what we know about SARS was that you are most infectious when you're most sick. Okay, so people who are in a, in a bed in a hospital uh, with a lot of virus in their stool, with a lot of virus in their secretions, uh, those were the people most likely to transmit to other people, which is why healthcare workers were such enormously increased risk. So stage of the illness matters in terms of how infectious you are um, to, to other people. Um, but, but in terms of super spreaders, Nick, do you have some wisdom to impart? Not about this new coronavirus, no. I don't think we know. Yeah, I, I mean, I haven't heard about, I mean, I think there have been one or two anecdotal reports in the press about maybe people who were, uh, you know, infected a lot of people, but uh, at the moment I don't know the answer to your question. So. Money. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know, my wife's a plane. Hi, I'm an infectious disease physician. I take care of people with infectious diseases in our local community hospitals here in Berkeley and Oakland. And um, in recent years, an increasing and alarmingly high percentage of my patients are living on the streets or in, in tent encampments. And I worry a great deal about what will happen if this virus starts spreading among our unhoused neighbors who are already suffering in great numbers from vaccine preventable illnesses which spread rapidly among tent encampments. A patient recently said to me in the hospital where he was because of two, not one, but two vaccine preventable pneumonias, everyone in the tents is sick. So I worry both in terms of morbidity and mortality suffering for these people and also about increased stigma uh, for a population that already suffers a great deal because of backlash. So I wonder um, how, as a public health community, we can uh, marshal this excitement about public health and infectious disease to draw attention to a current public health crisis in our community and also get out ahead of a potential uh, magnification of that crisis should coronavirus start spreading among tent encampments. Is the governor here? Uh, <laughs> you know, I agree with everything you said. We clearly have outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases in homeless populations, like hepatitis A, for example. Um, we, we, we clearly have dreadful sanitary conditions and people living in unacceptable circumstances. And I think everyone knows that the legislature recently failed to pass at least one piece of legislation that some people thought would help with the homeless problem. Uh, I'm sure there are different points of view about that piece of legislation, but, but we have a serious problem. And if this can help focus people's attention and, and helping the homeless, that would be great. But I'm not totally sure that's what's going to happen. Uh, I'm just adding that um, unfortunately what I could see happening is isolating those populations, not really hand tackling the underlying problem. And, and I just want to put in another plug. The public health nurses will go encampment to encampment and street to street to, to find people, and they do that. Again, there's not enough of them. So, yes, we're on the same page. You know, I will say, um, well, more immediately, I actually just talked to San Francisco about this specific problem. Um, I haven't written the story yet, but um, just in this current outbreak, they are actually having those conversations about what they're going to do if they find cases in like SROs, um, in encampments, and they're actually coming up with um, 
you know, where where people will be isolated if they identify cases. Because if somebody's in an SRO and they test positive, they can't stay in that SRO. That would be a disaster, and same with an encampment. So to me, I and they didn't want to have any answer for this, the harder thing would be like, right now, I think every case in the United States has been identified because that person self-reported, essentially. <coughs> like, they were caught, you know, given pamphlets, given information at the airport, and then got in touch with their public health department, and, you know, were kind of followed the whole way through. That's not going to happen, I would imagine, in, you know, these other populations, but um, probably if those populations are affected, we're at a different <coughs> stage in this outbreak anyway. Um, but that being said, the bigger issue you talk to, I mean, as a journalist who writes about those things all the time, I can tell you it's it feels like a never-ending battle to us too. Um, I, you know, write about these things and you try to drive these things home and it's just, it's, I think people get a little weary. They get, it, it feels insurmountable, especially with the homeless situation. It just, you know, I write about HIV and AIDS a lot and, um, you know, it just feels like until we tackle this homeless problem that there's, kind of limits to what we're going to be able to accomplish in getting real improvements in health disparities um, and, and addressing a lot of these conditions. And they're really, there's amazing efforts happening in communities to reach these populations and to kind of deal with people where they're at. And it's incredible the work. I'm just, every time I talk with folks who are on the front lines, I'm just so amazed by the work that they're doing and their persistence and drive. It's incredible. But obviously, at a certain point, there's just so much you can do. Um, and I don't know what the answer is. You keep writing about it, but here we are. So, so I was uh, I was told that we got cut off this conversation because people out in the atrium are already starting uh, with the food. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so I, I hope you found this conversation just as informative and as fascinating as I. Uh, and also just the, the, the kind of realizing that the critical importance of investment in, in public health in infrastructure. So, uh, so, so please join me uh, in thanking our speakers. Now, if you're interested in getting announcements for future events like this, uh, make sure that you leave your name and email with us before you leave. Uh, so this officially concludes our program, and please join us outside in the atrium for whatever food is left. <laughs>